What about Wombat's pooping squares? I've, I've read about that, so that one's definitely true. Wow. Wow. Are there any other animals that poop squares? The Welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Science, the show that breaks down the science of television and movies with a comedian and a scientist. Today, we're discussing Frozen 2, so I'll ask about reindeers, enchanted forests, and wombat poop. Hi everyone, I'm your host Ethan Edinburgh and I've got two wonderful guests joining me today. My first guest is an improviser and author of Training to Be Myself, an indulgent odyssey of obsessions, confessions, and curiosities. Welcome to the show, Jake Jabor. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for being here, Jake. I appreciate it. As I told you pre-show, I've seen you improvise several times and had a wonderful time doing so. So it's a, it's a thrill to actually talk to you and not just listen to you talk. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I, uh, this is nice. A conversation as opposed to uh, just a one-sided performance. I guess. Yeah, exactly. Although I did very much in, enjoy your performance. Uh, I've heard great things about your, your book as well. So congrats on that. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Indulgent is in the title and I feel like we've hit that uh, pretty strong already. So um, <laughs> it's great. Thank you. Um, before we get to the next guest, I did want to just ask you if you have seen the original Frozen. I have not. Um I was going in totally blind, but thankfully, uh, the little snowman did kind of a <laughs> recap of the first movie. So, uh, yep. Um, I, I I just had a weird feeling that we were in the same boat. I can't explain why that is. I'm not a medium, but I also have not seen the original Frozen. And, oh, okay. And was a, <laughs> I was a little bit confused by Olaf's recap, but uh, but I'm glad it was there. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, it came. It came at a point in the movie where I was like, "Well, at this point, I don't. <laughs> I've made it this far without knowing what happened in the first movie. I don't know that this is helping uh, me uh, connect any dots." But it was nice to have a little re recap. In yeah, there. that is such a good point, though. I did not put that together that, like, a, a better spot for that recap would have been the beginning of the movie. It's weird <laughs> that it's, like, almost halfway through. We're like, okay, let's talk about the first Frozen a little bit. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, so thank you for joining me. Um, I'm really excited to talk to our next guest. Uh, he is a global freshwater lead scientist at the World Wildlife Fund. Welcome to the show, Dr. Jeff Opperman. Great. Uh, very happy to be here. This is this is not my typical uh, Zoom call, so this is I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it's a Riverside call, so we're really <laughs> cranking it up here today. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm thrilled to talk to you, especially in your uh, your gamer headset, which I think looks awesome. <laughs> um, so. Uh, Doc Op, which I assume everybody calls you Doc Op. Is that correct, or is that just me? Uh, this is funny. My daughter's friends call me Doc Ops, and I've occasionally hmm. tried to get them to call me Special Ops, because I think that would be a, a kind of a cool variation on Doc Ops. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, you, can call me, uh, you can call me either. And I'm, I'm rarely called Doctor, okay. so, yeah. Great. <laughs> you could also call well, me. I don't want to break tradition here. <laughs> Uh, special Ops, uh, you wrote a 10-part series, Special Ops, about traveling down the Mekong River with your family. And I have difficulty going to Benihana with my family. So how did you keep everyone's spirits up during this journey? I think there was no other choice. You know, it was like, you know, they would either either stay on the boat and be happy or I guess not be in the boat and i think they wanted to stay in the boat but uh no they're they're uh they're really good travelers this this was a while ago they were they were eight and ten uh which actually mm -hmm. when you said you can't go to benihana ha with your family i don't know if you meant uh younger or older do you mean like with your parents or with your kids uh i don't have children so i really meant with just my <laughs> my siblings and my parents okay. Uh, well, yeah, if you had kids, you know that eight and 10 is perhaps the, the golden, it's the golden Goldilocks, right? It's, you know, 
right in the middle. Wow. Of the, when they're really young, they're challenging. When they get older, they're a little bit challenging in terms of maybe not wanting mm. to be with you. But eight and ten. Did you did you map that out? Did you know that going into your adventure? Were you like, this is the only time I can take these kids on a trip down the Mekong River. If I wait, it's going to be impossible. They're going to be on their cell phone. It's going to be insane. Uh, a little bit. I think we realized that uh, any earlier would have been uh, too early. Also, there's that whole crazy phenomenon of, of human memory that they would never, they wouldn't actually remember it if you went earlier. That just seems like right. a, you know, like one of those hypothetical questions: Would you take an amazing trip if you would have no memories of it? But that's if you take a four-year-old, that's a little bit what you're doing. You're taking them on an amazing <laughs> trip, and then they have no memories of it. So I, we true. wanted them to have memories. I would argue when we're dead, we have no memories. So everything we do, we will have no recollection of. But that's, yeah, it's taken it pretty deep, pretty quickly. Is that too dark for Frozen 2? <laughs> no. I mean, somebody in this film uh, yelled, like, we're all going to die uh, several times. Oh, yeah. There's some pretty dark themes in both Frozen's, yeah, but you guys pretty... didn't, you didn't fully prepare. And you did not <laughs> fully prepare what I think would have been watching Frozen. <laughs> oh, hold on a second. Special Ops, I doubt that you watched Frozen to prepare for this podcast. You probably have just seen Frozen. I watched Frozen, no, just as part of my standard uh, father duties. Correct. Right. Mm. At some okay. point, Very good. at some point, quite a while ago. Yes. Okay, well, I have to ask you a few questions before we get into the frozen world. Number one, with this journey, I read that you saw catfish the size of bears, which I didn't know existed. So is that true, Whoa. or was that just like a headline to get people into it, or what's going on there? Uh, so the Mekong giant catfish is, I looked it up, I was looking for a good good comparison, and uh, it's about the same weight as a grizzly bear, like 400, or bl maybe a black bear, I don't know, 400 pounds. So... Um, but it's it's uh, herbivorous, so it's kind of like catfish the size of a medium-sized cow or something, or maybe a smallish cow, because um, it just eats weeds and algae. But it's huge, yes. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, they're enormous. That's, that's wild. Okay, so yeah, didn't know that that was a true, real, on-earth species, especially one that, yeah, doesn't eat uh, any sort of animal. I mean, if they're just eating leaves, like, they must eat so many damn leaves all day. That's what elephants eat. They get pretty big. Okay, good call. <laughs> elephants are not small. <laughs> you guys learned something on this podcast today. <laughs> I also, uh, during my research this morning, uh, came upon a song entitled Flyaways to Get Them Home. Did you have something to do with this song? Did you write and perform this song? With my, uh, yes, my co-writer, Matt Simon, who, uh, he was the singer of my band in high school, of our band in okay. high school. Yeah. And, and during the pandemic, we started, uh, during the, the quarantine time, we started recording stuff together and and some with our with our high school band and uh wow then then i i helped him get into this this niche of songwriting of uh global conservation initiatives that need theme songs so he's actually Love that. he's written two theme songs so far he's an incredible songwriter actually he, i don't know if you listen to it. i mean I, I helped him with the words a little bit yeah. kind of the content but he he writes he could just like and he might write that in 15 minutes if you need a theme song for the i know you have one but if you needed a second theme unfortunately song. unfortunately i write music and i guess i'm <laughs> full of myself um but i've 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 also written tunes with the same purpose actually but we can talk about that after the podcast because i do get frustrated speaking to scientists on this show and feel like i have nothing to provide what can i do to bring some change and and what i can do is write some silly songs yeah i think a lot i, mean, I think a, a really catchy song uh can really, it's a little bit like schoolhouse rock, right? I mean, I think a lot of us know, yeah. understand how a bill becomes a law, mostly because of schoolhouse rock with that little, you know, that sad little, totally. sad mm -hmm. little bill sitting on the steps and because he got rejected and all that. Oh, yeah. But uh, so this is, a, this is like schoolhouse rock for conservation. That's what Matt is helping me do. This song is informative about... Uh, Yes, Something, uh, migratory birds. It? Sorry, I won't guess. <laughs> migratory birds. Migratory okay. birds and wetlands. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. And, and we, I'm gonna, I'll send you the link, Jake. And we have yeah, another, please. We have another song called Renewable Revolution that's all about um, how countries can get low-carbon electricity without damming rivers.
I love this. Um, we're going to have to put the link in the show notes or put it at the end or something. We'll tell people about it. But I love that. I thought that was great. Uh, shocked me while I was having my coffee this morning. <laughs> Does this happen a lot when you have a comedian and a scientist on where, like, the comedian then feels very bad that, A, their chosen career is uh, not science and I don't do improv scenes that are educational <laughs> and informative about how to help the environment like <laughs> uh first off uh, yes this does happen okay. very often and secondly i would argue that you are informing people through your improv because you never know what you're going to talk about you're inspiring them you might let's say some uh, pop culture reference they didn't know about now they have to do some research so every that's everything's true. a learning experience uh, that's very kind of you i don't think uh I would love to think that somebody watched my improv show and like went home and was like, I am going to recycle uh, or something <laughs> like that. Uh, Listen, they sure. might have been depressed before seeing your show and now you've cheered them up and they go home and they're like, you know what? I'm going to clean up around here. And, yeah, and afterwards, all right. I'm going to throw this in the recycling. Great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, the recycling company will receive those things and go, oh, we don't accept this and burn it. And it'll but, all go you know, trash. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We do our best. Um, okay, so Frozen 2, guys. We have to talk about this. It, I, I, In case you're listening, you don't know what we're talking about. You might not have heard of it. It only made $1.5 billion at the box office, uh, oh which I assume is not including merch and God knows what. Um, but I got to say... Even without having seen Frozen, I really liked Frozen 2. I was very moved, uh, weirdly. <laughs> Maybe weirdly. I don't know if you guys were too. But especially the music. Uh, as a musician, I was really into the soundtrack for this movie. Um, I loved how much music there was. It was it was coming at you from, from all characters. And I just really enjoyed it. So I wanted to see what you thought, Jake. Especially uh, being somebody who also is has is not privy to frozen one yeah well um and it it was a little tough for me because somebody had summarized frozen one to me is sort of like it is bad there is no plot wow it's just like held together with a bunch of really great songs so okay. i was trying to sort of you know give frozen two a fair shake being that i had only heard about that from its predecessor I feel like even if I had seen Frozen 1, I would have still been slightly confused as to what was happening most of the time. Uh, uh, in this kid's which, movie? Yes, in this children's movie. Um, uh, I, I really did not understand a ton. Um, and also the whole time I was watching it, I was like, oh, a scientist is watching this. And so often what is uh the explanation for things is like magic um <laughs> sure. or or a like talking olaf uh who is going through incredible existential dread it feels like and also <laughs> but also might potentially be accurate in some of the science so i was kind of wrapped up in sort of the uh, the assignment i was given um, but I had a, I had a fine time at the movies. I read about it a little afterwards and, uh, mm. the Wikipedia entry was like, the themes are, uh, anti-imperialism and feminism and, uh, eco preservation or something. And I was like, uh, I did not get all that until I read that. And then I was like, oh yeah, that all makes sense. Um, so, uh, I was mostly confused, but enjoyed it. Nice. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience, too. I wasn't uh, absolutely sure what was going on. It seemed like, I guess, the main plot here is that they're trying to find the truth of the past in order to free the forest, the mechanics of which, a little blurry on, but I definitely enjoyed that that journey for them to find it. But but what did you think, Special Ops? <laughs> um, let's see. Well, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I think that it's funny you referenced... Um, the Wikipedia article and it had all those complexities and layers and then earlier you said it's a lot for a kids film it's kind of like the, uh, the the Phantom Menace you remember the, the, that Star Wars the first the mm -hmm. reboot and how crazy complicated the plot was it was about trade federations and bl blockades and <laughs> uh, tax policy and and anyhow it, it's supposed to be you know it's supposed to be about the good and evil and all that and it was a little crazy so they were packing a lot of things in 
And I think maybe that's why you were confused at times because they were coming mm-hmm. at so many different angles, which it actually was a very ambitious attempt to pack in these themes and somehow keep it uh, lighthearted and whimsical for children. Um, you mentioned Olaf and, and in the, the science, you mentioned the science behind Olaf. The science is well established behind Olaf from the, the ground, the groundbreaking research on, on Frosty, I think is, is what we can, what we can look to, to, um, you know, to understand the science of Olaf. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought it was, a, I thought it was good. It was great music. And, uh, and certainly cause I work in conservation and I work in river restoration. It was very interesting to see them. I kept thinking, are they really going to make, uh, dam removal and river restoration the central symbol? of renewal <laughs> and they did so i couldn't believe it so yep uh, that's right up my alley oh nice you must have been freaking out freaking out. high-fiving your friends yeah. cheering <laughs> when you saw that dam you're like hell yeah dude damn in this movie that's right um yeah so and speaking of olaf he kind of goes oh off if i will mm-hmm. if i may uh, and and asks a bunch or, or gives a bunch of trivia at to to entertain them on their journey. So I had to ask you about these things oh, that good. he said. Yeah, is that cool? What, yeah, I I felt like I was again viewing this through the lens of like comedy and science. So I, uh, Olaf would say something, and I'd be like, "That's a joke." They'll uh, I'll be asked about the joke, and then I was like, "That's a science fact." Uh, the, our scientists will be asked about that, and then there was magic, and I was like, "I don't know if we'll cover that." Uh, <laughs> Question so, mark. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm yeah. glad we're gonna get to the science trivia. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna get to the science trivia. Also, how evil would it be if I asked you about like the accuracy of the jokes? Like, rate these jokes, improve these jokes in this in this script. Rate uh, uh, happily, uh, improve. <laughs> maybe uh, might take me a minute, but I did go like that's an old joke. Uh, there were times where I was like, that's a twenty year old joke. The first one, and I think Anna says this kind of quickly when they're like doing charades or playing at the beginning somewhere but i wrote down what sound does a giraffe make because Mm -hmm. i believe she says that and then there's no answer they kind of like move on so can you tell me what sound a giraffe makes i think that's improv go oh (laughs) oh okay (laughs) it's flipping it on you Uh, oh great uh i mean like yeah right you're on the stage they say sound of giraffe improv what do you do yeah (laughs) <laughs> that I sounds think, accurate I to think, me, man. Okay. I, I don't you know. It. I think right. you nailed it. <laughs> okay, so that one, we're, it's a question mark. We're unsure. what. Maybe it's just a weird, maybe they barely make sounds. I don't know. He also says that men are six times as likely to be struck by lightning. Do you know about this? Checks out. Okay, okay checks out. <laughs> I, I read something similar, but I wasn't sure. I think mo- I would guess it's mostly from just foolish behavior yeah men are like six times more dumb than women i don't think that i don't think lightning preferentially finds you know xy chromosomes i think that um people with xy chromosomes happen to be out saying hey i'm gonna you know hold my beer i'm gonna go try to make it across this golf course hold my red bull i'm gonna try hang gliding that sounds like a guy's quote so six times is dumb is what we're I think so. I think say. that's accurate. Yeah. Yes. But we don't have a okay. neurologist on the program today, and I will check, but I, I believe that that's accurate. Okay. So what about gorillas burping when they're happy? Um, they do have a diet of, uh, of they eat a lot of very uh, fibrous vegetation, you know, s- stems, leaves. I would think that would cause a, a lot of fermentation type activities in their gut leading okay. to a lot of buildup of, of gases that when they chuckle, that it's like opening the door and the, yeah, that all, I think that makes sense. I think there's a testable hmm. hypothesis there. Okay. I'm into that. That's cool. I uh, did not know that one was going to go that way. What about wombats pooping squares? I've, I've read about that. So that one's definitely true. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So are there any other animals that poop squares? No, I think the reason that people talk about wombats is because they're unique in that way. Yeah, I mean, it sure sounds unique. And and this is just a completely, you know, scientific question, but is that because of their butthole? I think it would have to be. I think there's no other way to get it to be square. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry for taking a second here, but you, what you're telling me <laughs> is that wombats have a perfectly square butthole. If they had a square uh, intestine, but not a square butthole, wouldn't there be some rearrangement of the shape? Sure. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe they have a very square uh, intestine and then, you know, the pellets are kind of hard, so they're not going to get, so the butthole could be any shape and it's, a, it's the shape of the, another another hypothesis that needs testing. Although actually, it doesn't need to be tested. We just have to call a wombat expert. I bet wombat experts are so tired of that. <laughs> I bet that's the only thing they ever get asked. Yeah. Not if they're endangered. <laughs> Not where you can find. I bet uh, nine out of ten questions is uh, what shape is a wombat's butthole? Right. Yeah. Uh, Why the weird poop? My next question was going to be like, when we say square, that doesn't truly describe the three-dimensional poop. Like, are we talking about a cube? Is it square on all sides? I think what it's a is cube. It? What's happening? I it is a cube. cube. It's a cube. Not to get too scientific, but it depends how long it is, right? Uh, otherwise, it could be a rectangle. A rectangular prism. Or is that? A rectangular prism. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so just to get on the record here, the wombat's poop can either be a cube or a rectangular prism. If we do ask a wombat expert, I do, I I think, as Jake was saying, they're probably tired of this. So I think maybe we should come up with like seven or eight questions that we would start with. Fake questions. And then casually just like, oh, and oh, just one other thing. Yeah, a little Frost Nixon for wombat experts. Yeah. <laughs> gotta gotta get them comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, that's really strange. So I really didn't think that one was going to go that way. And I guess we should ask Jake, are they in danger? Do you know about the like, safety of wombats? Should we be concerned? Was that for Jake? Me? <laughs> no, I was just piggybacking on Jake's <laughs> concern. I was asking you, Jeff. Oh, oh my gosh. Um <laughs> I don't know how they are doing. I, I I know that Australia has a lot of endangered species because it's mm-hmm. a, it's an island and they have species that are nowhere else. So if there's you know problems there, there's there's no reserve population somewhere else. So uh, Australia has a lot of mm. endangered species, but um, but it has some very there's you know kangaroos are as plentiful as deer. I mean there's deer everywhere here and there's yep. kangaroo some kangaroos everywhere. So I don't know if wombats are more like kangaroos or more like you know, Tasmanian devils, they're, I think they're pretty mm. rare. Well, they sound rare to me considering their poop. So Sven, uh, the character Sven is a reindeer, speaking of deer. And my first question with that is, are reindeer the same thing as caribou? What's up? I think so. I think uh, maybe the same species. I think that often reindeer is a term used for a caribou-like species that has been at least semi-domesticated so there are herds oh yeah the lap laplanders i think uh and other indigenous groups in the far north that have herds of what look like caribou but i think they're called reindeer when they become semi-domesticated whoa so it's like a wolf dog situation could be you know wolves and dogs have different scientific names as if you know like canis loop Canis lupus and Canis something. Canis canis, maybe. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but they can interbreed. So they're basically still the same species. You know, a dog and a wolf can breed, mm. produce puppies. So they're really no the same. Problem. So I think caribou and reindeer, I'm sure, could interbreed. So they're basically the same species, but they may have some differentiation along the path to being, you know, semi domesticated by the herders. And then, the, and then, then some of them can fly, of course. Obviously. Yeah. This is a kid's show, so. They're different. They're a different species, the flying ones. And the one, the single one with a light up red nose, that's a... Different species, or? Can that breed with other reindeer is what we're, uh, I think, trying to get? Or with a wolf? (laughs) (laughs) I I, I was trying to go down a little bit of a... I was going to say rabbit hole, but I guess a reindeer hole of uh, of research in the morning because I was curious. I realized I really don't know anything about them. And I was reading that their their noses are able to warm the air before they breathe it. Do you know about this? Is that true? I doubt they're warming the air that's like in in the space before the nostril. I don't, I don't think they pre-warm that. I think what it must be saying okay. is they have um, – 
probably a very a, a lot of coils, sort of a passageway, that it spends time in the passageway warming up before it hits the lungs. Ooh. That's what I'm thinking they mean. They have the ability okay. to raise the temperature. You know, so if the air is coming in and it's kind of going through some passageways a bit convoluted, it spends some time warming up a little bit before it hits the lungs. And I heard that they migrate further than any land animal. Is that true? I only know slightly more about reindeer than I do wombats. Um, we, at WWF, we actually have... How do they uh, poop? We have, the, we have an expert on animal migrations. So I would be really hesitant to oh. answer this question when there, there's a scientist named Robin Naidu who he puts collars on animals, uh, all kinds of animals in Africa, and then can radio track them or GPS track them and produce maps. And there's animal, the, you know, zebras and and buffalo and elephants and wild dogs and lions and all and he can just track all their movements and some of them make remarkably long movements um mm -hmm. but i have heard that caribou do some pretty impressive migrations so oh wow. right i should call them caribou also if they're on their own yeah i would say if reindeer migrated really far without their owners knowing it there there would be some consequences yeah they're in big trouble yeah we're gonna get a spanking when they get back yeah <laughs> Is that still the, is that 2021 appropriate to do to your reindeer? <laughs> I don't know. I don't have kids. In terms of size of, and I assume these are of a similar species or it will uh, show my ignorance. It does it go like deer, elk, caribou moose or moose caribou, which is the biggest of those Great type question. of animals? I'm thinking... I'm thinking you got elk and caribou off. So I'm thinking it goes deer, reindeer, caribou, elk, moose. Really? Mm. Elk okay. are huge. Elk are the size of the horse. Okay. Or okay. maybe that's moose. Anyhow, elk and moose are both much bigger than you think. They're, yeah. How much smaller is the caribou? Uh, I, I, not positive, but I think it's somewhere between an elk and a deer. Okay. Yeah. But we could ride it, like in the movie. <laughs> uh, well, I, I can't. Yeah, I, I, I think um, I'm, I'm not sure how big you guys are. I can't. You're, you're just. I just see your. Oh, I'm huge, dude. I'm jacked up. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe you can't. Maybe you need to focus on riding elk only. That's your. Yeah. That's your ride. Once you get jacked that's up, that's my ride. You've got to be elk or moose. Otherwise, it's just cruel. Yeah. No, I'm a completely average. Uh, I can probably ride a wolf or a dog. No problem. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so I wondered if this bothered you as a, a man of the rivers because they, at one point, use an, a little ice boat to travel down a river, and it seems like it's totally fine, and the ice is not going anywhere, and I thought maybe this would bother you. Maybe this ice would melt at some point and it didn't well the whole scene only took a couple minutes so as far as we know it was melting uh on the underneath and okay. of course uh i don't think any of us know what the water temperature was of that river it could have been you know 34 degrees and okay. then that ice would last a long time i mean go to go to a river when it's when it's thawing and breaking up and there's big chunks of ice and they're just floating downstream and they'll float no downstream for a long time because the water is only 34 degrees. So all I'm saying, got it. That was one of the least liberties that they took. <laughs> that did not bother me. That didn't bother me. It bothered me that it bothered you, Jake. That seemed incredibly uh, reckless. I know that. Uh... <laughs> I, I I don't need to nitpick all of it, but I think she was trying to save her sister. And so she threw her into an ice boat and propelled her. Like, it seemed like she sent her into danger or yep. uh, like uh, I, that. Totally. I was like, oh, now her sister is in trouble and has to, like, figure out what to do because she, like, launched her off into the woods. Uh, she could so have launched herself first of all, towards the direction she was going or like put up a frozen wall or froze her sister's feet yeah. and then that would melt after a certain period of time. But you're right. <laughs> she puts her into a boat and then that boat could easily crash into a tree, break into a bunch of pieces. It's ice. 
Uh, and then she sent her right into the Earth Giant lair, where they could have easily yeah. crushed her. She's a murderer. That was one of the things I clocked of, like, um, just being totally shocked that that was the the choice that was made. Uh, mm. Yeah. Independent of the science, it just seemed irresponsible. Um, Elsa could be arrested for attempted murder. I think we're all agreeing on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I ask a trivia question? Anything. They said? Anything. What about water passing through four individuals? Oh, good one. Is that, I think that was what the thing said? Mm hmm. Olaf. Yes. Um, and I think that that's an underestimate because water isn't really created or destroyed. We have the same water on Earth as the water that was on Earth in those, you know, primordial seas billions of years ago. Whoa. And so <clears throat> if you think about it, and, and dinosaurs were alive for hundreds of millions of years. So there are people who have estimated that every molecule of water, so if you have a glass of water in front of you, every molecule of that has been drank and passed through the kidneys and peed out by a dinosaur probably many times. Whoa. So I think it's probably more than four. Four seemed like an underestimate or at least only temporarily true in the sense that like by the time it gets to me, it's been through four. Well, after I have it, won't it have then been through five? Like I don't mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and maybe I'm not I don't understand the time uh, accurately, but it felt like if everybody who watched that movie was like, whoa, and then we all drank a glass of water, that fact is no longer <laughs> true. Accurate. Right? Yeah. That's a, that is that is a very astute observation. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, that was the one that was most interesting to me. Uh, and I really like that one. I thought that was kind of cool that, like, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess it could be seen as a little, like, maybe uncomfortable. But I was like, oh, I like the idea that I've had water that, yeah, maybe a dinosaur has had or, like, uh, mm. John Wayne has had or uh, <laughs> Will Chamberlain or something like that. I thought that was cool. <laughs> Yeah, that was going to be my question. Like, does my Brita filter take out Will Chamberlain's piss? <laughs> I, I read the read the fine print. Yeah. <laughs> what? I threw that away months well, ago. I think it would months have told ago. you. It might have oh. a list. Might have a list of you know <laughs> who it can efficiently remove and who it can't. So. I feel like we've done plenty of rated R movies on the show, and it had to be on Frozen 2. We, like, really crossed the line a few times here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, speaking of that, I thought you were going to ask me about the trivia about the turtle that can breathe through their butts. Yes, that's also yeah. on my list. I oh, wanted to know. Okay. Yes. Uh, and that is true. Um, but it's not all turtles. There's just one turtle, the Fitzroy River Turtle from Australia. Wow, um, Fitzroy River Turtle. Yeah, I think that so WWF has a um, species, freshwater species of the week, and I do believe we have featured that turtle as a species of the week. So I'd actually heard Ooh. of it. Wow! Uh, when Congrats, he said that. Uh, Fitzroy. Yeah. While we're on that subject, slightly, uh, the movie Ghost in the Darkness. Um, I don't know if you you are either of you are familiar. Uh, Michael Douglas and Val Kilmer are in Africa, and they kill two lions that are killing people okay um, sounds sick in that movie <laughs> val kilmer is kind of the olaf uh and he's always like giving facts about uh africa and he says that hippos fart through their mouth and i was like isn't that a burp <laughs> like i didn't un <laughs> Uh, Are you sure he was giving out facts in this movie? He's <laughs> <laughs> not just saying stuff. Uh, I, yeah, he could have been, but I was like, "How is that? Uh, a, is it true? And B, I, isn't that a burp? I don't under. Isn't it just being gas released from the body, which maybe is above or below, way below your pay grade? But um, right, special ops. What do you think? Are are hippo burps <laughs> so smelly that they're considered farts? I mean. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think one distinction could be the, you know, the, the exit, you know, front or back exit. Okay. Um, the other distinction might be the origination of the gas. So okay. if somehow, 
you know, a burp might originate in the stomach and a, and a, you know, fart is lower. Uh, and maybe hippos, oh. maybe hippos somehow send it all the way from the back to the front. To the front. Yeah. Okay. And that would distinguish okay. it. But, you know, this is Val Kilmer in a movie from 25 years ago. <laughs> we, we, may, we, yeah. we, we may want to check some more recent sources. I don't think we yeah, need to. I think Val Kilmer 25 <laughs> years ago is all I need. But uh, thank Fair. you for that offer. Um, and so, okay, so the Fitzroy River turtle can uh, breathe through their butt. That, that's the only species. That I know of, yeah, of turtle. Well, and do they also breathe another way or this they just, for whatever reason, have switched it to uh, butt breathing? I think they can breathe through their mouth as well. I think it's an adaptation for... I don't know. Maybe they like to spend a lot of time um, eating, you know, like oh. submerged eating, right. and they yeah. don't want to take the time to come up and breathe. So they, and if they're, sure. in, you know, up like a duck, you know, the way ducks eat. Oh, yeah. Listen, um, brother, I've been there. I would love to just keep eating and not breathe and <laughs> breathe out of my butt while I got a burger in my mouth. <laughs> Kidding me? Yeah. That's well, cool. Keep trying. <laughs> evolution Eventually, might just happen to you <laughs> my kids there kids might be able to do it right. <laughs> yeah wow that's amazing okay that's really cool well speaking of we're running out of time here but special ops what do you want to tell people about or or where can they you know uh find more information about the the wwf and i say that with pride ah my goodness i should have been prepared for that um Sorry. Well, put you on the if spot. You, if you Google World Wildlife Fund, <laughs> you will immediately go to the web page of the WWF, um, and there you can get all the information about the conservation work that we do, how you can become members. I think there's a million members in the U.S., maybe five million members worldwide. So a lot of members, a lot of people uh, who who are you know signed up to support, and a lot of great uh, a lot of great programs around the world. So, yeah, cool. I mean, I would lo love for people to learn more and, and become supporters. Okay, fantastic. And Jake, what about you, buddy? You want to tell people about something? Yeah, um, you can pick up my book. Uh, it came out this uh, July. It's called, as you mentioned at the top of the show, Training to Be Myself. Uh, it's a memoir of sorts. I took a train trip across the country for an improv podcast tour. And I, I remember like calling it an indulgent uh, putting self-indulgent in the title and somebody was like, you're not going to want to do that. And I was like, that's what it is. Not knowing that I would uh, be on a podcast with uh, a scientist who works for the WWF being like, join our uh, like <laughs> plugging worldwide conservation. And I'm kind of like, pick up a book where I sort of complain about being alone. Um, <laughs> but uh, that is an option for anybody. And then... I just really wanted to ask you, uh, Doc Ops, quickly. Um, I'm constantly uh, – I spend a lot of time, like, reading about water because I'm freaking out about it. Um, and I read about, uh, like, a technology um, where they're, like, pulling uh, precipitation from the air uh, to, like – make water uh i don't know if i have that right at all but i was curious if you had like if there was any sort of water technology you were excited about is that a crazy question but something to that i could be like not to not to keep me from like preserving and conserving water but something to maybe make me feel less dreadful uh full, less olaf uh as i get older and mature sure well i mean i think um the technology that you referred to uh, Jake I think that's the moisture farming on on the planet Tatooine that we saw at oh, the beginning okay. of Star Wars right I mean that's that's what they did they had the evaporators and the moisture so I'm not sure if that's what you referred to but uh, <laughs> but I imagine if they are doing it it would be in some place like the Atacama Desert that has almost no water but it has fog that rolls in and you could probably extract it it's going to be a probably a very niche solution um technology you know i'm not uh, there's definitely amazing technologies for um cleaning water treating water but the technology that has me most excited 
in terms of river conservation is actually solar panels because solar panel technology has gotten so cheap and, and accessible that it, it means that countries don't have to build hydropower dams on rivers. That's actually mm. a huge breakthrough is other energy alternatives to not have to build hydropower dams. So it's not a water technology, but that's the technology that has me excited. I love that. Yeah. That's nice. great. And, okay. And it, oh, I no. just want to, if I could, uh, if I could pretend you asked me that question about where people should go for resources again. Um, of course. If, can I pretend that or can you ask me again? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Special ops. Where should people go for resources? No, I mean about, yeah. Okay. So you could go to worldwildlife.org. Yes. Um, and that is the website and you can learn all about our conservation work, how to become a member and about our freshwater programs, how we're working to, uh, conserve lakes and rivers around the world. Great. Yes. Everybody go right now, put it into your URL, worldwildlifefund.org. Help them out. We all live on the planet together. Get with it. Is that too aggressive? No, that's awesome. I think, yeah, I think you have a, you have a real future in this. Oh, great. Three years in. <laughs> no, in, uh, you know, in conservation marketing. I mean, oh, great. Well, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. again, I do want to talk to you about that, but that's a different, uh, that's for a different time, different podcast. Um, all right. Thank you guys seriously so much. And I'll talk to you next time for Frozen 3, thawing out the <laughs> evil. I don't know.